This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, and then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Hey everyone, quick heads up at the top here. There's a bit of salty language in this episode, but it's all in good fun. All right, here's the show. Sachi, does Kamala Harris have a theme song right now? Oh. <laughs> this is Slate's Sachi Cole. Yeah, and I think it's like probably from like a Charlie XCX album. It's probably from Brad, and she probably doesn't get it. Um, and I don't know that we all get it, but I like it. I called Sachi up because less than 24 hours after Joe Biden dropped his bid to be the Democratic nominee for president, all signs were pointing to one successor, Kamala Harris. And for once, senior politicos were speaking the same language as internet stands. This Charlie XCX song, for instance, it's become the background music for a whole lot of supercuts of the VP. Dancing with children, laughing, and talking about falling out of coconut trees. You know, she was giving a speech and she's talking about an expression that her mom used to say, which is, you know, you think that you have no context. You think that history doesn't impact you. But the way she says it is, you think you fell out of a coconut tree? (laughs) My mother used to, she would give us a hard time sometimes and she would say to us, I don't know what's wrong with you young people. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? (laughs) You exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. (laughs) It always makes me laugh because it is such a like auntie expression. Like it's inexplicable. I wish I could explain all of this to a pioneer. Sachi knows that there are real policy issues to think about right now. Questions about how a Harris administration would govern, how the would-be president would negotiate with leaders abroad, not to mention her colleagues on Capitol Hill. But also, Kamala Harris has a fundamental silliness, despite her best efforts, that's going to make what happens next really interesting. She is funny and she doesn't even fully understand it or doesn't understand why. And I can, you can tell it's annoying to her. You can tell she really does want to be treated seriously. Some of that is just plain sexism and racism because, of course, she's a woman, so she has to be softer, right? She can't be too hardline. She can't be a bitch. But some of it is because she's funny. What I like about your writing is that you acknowledge that Kamala Harris is goofy, but you still take her seriously. And you write about how there's kind of a dark side to Kamala Harris's goofiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like you talk about this moment she went on the Drew Barrymore show as vice president and how she was treated. You are a stepmother Mm -hmm. to Ella and Cole. Yes. Um, Yes, this is one of my um, most favorite moments of television history. And I, like, I'm going to be 85 being walked into a home and talking about, like, did you see that Mamala clip on the Drew Barrymore show 400 years ago? (laughs) Um, First of all, I'll tell you, we we kind of don't use the term step. Because I just think I love Disney. However, Disney kind of messed that up <laughs> you know, for a lot of us over the years. You know, the evil step parent. Um, and their word for me is Mamala. And so they call me Mamala. But um, Drew Barrymore, as she is wont to do, basically is almost like trying to sit in her lap and is holding her hands and is saying to her, you know, we need somebody who's going to take care of this country, you know, we are in crisis, we need, you know, we need a great protector. We need you to be Mamala of the country. (laughs) And let me tell you, Kamala Harris looks like somebody just spat into her mouth and told her to enjoy it. 
I don't think people fully know that much about Kamala and the way we are making fun of her, I think is so interesting. I am excited to see how it changes and mutates as we see really who she is. Cause I think like, you know, the next hundred days, we're really gonna get to know Auntie. Today on the show, for the last three years, Kamala Harris has been the butt of plenty of online jokes. But is she about to have the last laugh? I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, or automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, or automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. You've written that Kamala Harris's vice presidency has been largely defined by being the butt of the joke, but that before she became VP, she had all the makings of a promising candidate. So can we go back to before the memes and just Talk about, like, for those who aren't up on Harris and her background, what was she doing before she joined the Biden administration? Yeah, man, she has one of those backgrounds that's like political catnip. So, you know, she's a biracial woman of color, first generation American raised um, in the U.S. Her mother was a scientist from India. Her dad was an economist from Jamaica. Both of them were super liberal. They met at civil rights protests when they were studying at Berkeley in the 60s. Like, it writes itself Her political career, however, you know, it started in the early 90s when she was a deputy district attorney in California. She has oscillated really wildly between kind of enforcing the status quo of what we know about policing, what we know isn't fair about policing, to trying, it seems, to inject more fairness into a system that, you know, I don't think works. So Trump called her the most liberal member of the Senate, and she herself has described herself as a progressive um, prosecutor. That is not really accurate. She arrested a whole lot of people for having marijuana. And she had a truancy program when she was in San Francisco where she was going to parents and being like, we're going to punish you if your kids aren't in school. Yes. You know, she she was reluctant to involve herself in cases around police shootings in California when she was attorney general. She's defended the California death penalty. She has fought to keep nonviolent offenders incarcerated in California prisons. I mean, this is not she's not Karl Marx, y'all. Like, this is a pretty centrist a candidate, generally speaking, and then her record on policing and prosecution is like a little a little right of center, frankly, I think. So the funny thing is that she's always been stuck in this dichotomy of she's presenting herself as progressive, but also she she couldn't really do it all the way because there were all these voters who wouldn't vote for her if she was, you know, a black and brown progressive there that a lot of people find that scary but at the same time she wants to sort of present a little bit of progressivism so that all of these socialists want to vote for her which they don't i mean this is another election where people who are left of center a lot of them are going to be pinching their nose as they go to the ballot box yeah it's interesting because i've heard some commentators basically say that she wasn't the candidate of the moment back when she ran in 2019 for the presidency yeah but maybe she is now Because we're in this moment where Democrats are saying stuff like defund the police failed. And, um, you know, she was never really a defund the police person. So it's like in some ways it's it's a real contrast, you know, the cop versus the felon kind of thing when you compare her next to Trump. And it's a nice contrast. It's an interesting contrast. I mean, I don't know that she is the candidate of the moment. I think she's just the one we have. I mean, it's sort of like that Batman thing of like, is this the hero we deserve or the one that we need? Um, 
I don't know. I think it's just the one that's in front of us. <laughs> I think, you know, this would have been a very different conversation if Biden had dropped out earlier. I'll say that. Yeah. So once she was in office as vice president, you've written that President Biden almost immediately moved to defang her. Do we know why? I I wish I I had a clear answer. My most cynical guess is that a woman of color, a black and brown woman in the Biden office would be very easily weaponized by the right and would be very easily weaponized by, you know, Trumpian politics and Trump himself and Trump supporters. And it was clear after they won that Trump was not going away and that entire faction of the country was not going away. And I think maybe they thought it was safer to keep her out of it because just by her being there, you know, she is loathed. And I think this election is going to be really interesting. I am dreading the hand wringing around you know, how a woman of color is going to be treated in this election cycle versus the whitest man in America, Donald Trump. How did the defanging play out? Tell me more about that. Yeah, she had run this campaign that had been that had been, I think, tricky for her because, again, people didn't know if they felt comfortable by the kind of progressive she was or unsafe with the kind of progressive she was on both sides. But I mean, like the jobs they gave her were like classic low stakes shit that you see on on Veep, like In 2021, they appointed her to handle migration issues, and then all the Republicans started calling her the border czar. (laughs) Well, there was this, like, disastrous interview that she gave to Lester Holt where she really couldn't explain herself, like, what she was doing. Let me just quickly put a button. Do you have any plans to visit the border? I'm here in Guatemala today at some point. You know, we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So you, this whole this whole this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. And I, I, mean, I don't know. And I just, there's also reporting that basically when Biden handed her this position, she went to, I think, Ron Klain and was like, please don't give me this. This is a trap. This is a disaster yeah. because you can't solve it in four years. You know, you just can't. Um, so. It really was a mess. And even from the outside, I remember looking at it and being like, what? Why are you giving her the like Rubik's Cube here? (laughs) Yeah, it's like when you get like when you're cooking and your kids in the kitchen and they're two and you're like, here's a spoon, like help me cook. Like it's like not it was it didn't feel real. I mean, a lot of her her even her campaign events have been like silly, like, you know, they're sending her to do stuff where she is just not going to be able to be effective. Her doing Uh, events for reproductive rights and talking about what she and Biden are going to do after they're reelected to bring Roe versus Wade back. I mean, it it falls flat because we're all sort of looking at her like, well, girl, you're in now. (laughs) Like, what have you been doing the last four years? Why do I trust you for another four? So now she's in a different position. I'm really curious to see what she says now that she actually has some power. But they had just sort of like thrown her out there whenever, you know, okay, well, she's going to talk about like, She'll talk about being a black woman. She'll talk about being an Indian woman. She'll talk about being a woman. But they don't really have her discuss the economy or like war or climate change. She's never really in those discussions. She is in a bedazzled jacket on a float doing something for pride, which is great. But it is posturing, right? Like it doesn't really tell me anything. You know who else does stuff for pride? Chase Bank. Chase Bank loves pride. (laughs) Corporate pride. You said, you know, often she kind of gets caught up in this word salad as vice president. Can you just explain that a little bit? Like when she speaks uh, until now, what is that like and, and what have you observed? I think she is stuck trying to say nothing with as many words possible because I don't think there is a lot that she can say because I think she recognizes that the stuff she is saying ultimately will alienate someone. That's just how this works. I mean, that's how politics works. And But is that like a vice president problem? Like she can't say much because she's not really the person who should be saying much of anything? I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, I think it. I think we'll see, you know, in the coming weeks if that is a VP problem. But it seemed to be a problem before she was the vice president. I kind of think this is a Kamala problem. <laughs> I, think, so I think some people read insincerity in her Whether or not that's true, it doesn't matter. People perceive it. And part of it is because her answers to things can be muddled. It's 
a little foggy how she feels about certain things. I mean, her saying like, you know, the children of this generation, they are our children of this generation. You know, when we talk about our children, I know for this group, we all believe that when we talk about the children of the community, they are a children of the community. Girl, what does that mean? What are you talking about? It's funny. Thank God it's funny. Otherwise, it would just be sad. Yeah. It's interesting. You seem to be of the opinion that, like, Kamala never, like, had a chance and and has always been kind of having trouble speaking. I do feel like she's gotten stronger as she's been in the office. Like, even though she can't fix anything with abortion right now, she does speak pretty eloquently about it. Yes. And that does feel like a change to me where she was able to get her reps in as vice president. And that's important moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I again, I'm curious to see what kind of a person she is now that she doesn't have to be beholden to somebody else's government. Right. And I think like she was I think she was a more eloquent speaker, like when she was on the campaign trail herself. Like I watched a lot of those speeches. I didn't find her that funny then. But there was still something inherently funny about her. Um, I, I do think she's improved. I think some of it is like fundamentally and generationally, some people are always going to laugh at her. <laughs> There's just there is something funny about her and you can't help it. And I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to laugh at people in power. I think that is actually a great practice. And I think if we did more of it, we wouldn't end up in so much trouble all the time. I'm all for it. I think we should keep laughing at her. I think it's a good way to keep people in check um, to know, you know, does the emperor have any clothes? And, And now she's, you know, she could become the most powerful person in the country. And I think that's worthy of um, a joke. Sachi and I will return after a quick break. This show is brought to you by Discover. Have you heard about double nomics? It's okay if you haven't. It's extremely niche and practiced by Discover. Here's an example Discover automatically doubles the cash back earned on your credit card at the end of your first year with Cashback Match. That means with Discover, you could turn $150 cash back into $300. It pays to Discover. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Mix things up with any size lemonade or sweet tea for $1.49. Perfect with our classic fries. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I feel like in the last three weeks, I've sensed this change online in terms of how Kamala Harris is discussed, right? Because the memes are still happening, but the memes seem to be operating towards a different end. They seem more like cheerleadery than they have been over the last three years. Have you noticed that too? Yeah, I have. I I mean, I think Biden was just such a disaster that people were like, this is literally all we have. Like, this is the only option. I mean, look around. Who who were they going to pick? Gretchen Whitmer? They tried to kidnap her. <laughs> like, <laughs> but try it. <laughs> Let me know what happens. Run her out. Somebody else was like, maybe it'll be Gavin Newsom. You know who's super popular and has never been recalled? Gavin Newsom. I definitely think that's a great option. Like, it was, we were just, there was nothing. We were in a dearth of possibility. And so, of course, people are like, well, she's been training for this job for the last few years. She at least knows where all of the offices are. They wouldn't have to make her a new key card. (laughs) It's just easier. (laughs) It's just easier. Biden announced he was suspending his re-election campaign in this surprise letter Sunday on Twitter. He notably did not endorse Kamala Harris in that letter. He waited like a half an hour, and then he tweeted out his support. What did you make of how that all played out? I think for some reason um, the Democrats are mindful about it seeming like they're just handing it to her which I I can kind of understand because I think there will inevitably be discourse about how she doesn't deserve it and she's not smart. And again, some of that will be fair critique and some of that will be just racist, sexist drivel. And, you know, seems like they didn't want it to seem like it was just a coronation, right? But I I think that's it. I I feel 
like it's pretty inevitable that she'll clinch it. I don't know for sure. And every time I say like, I'm pretty sure this is going to happen, then like the moon falls out of the sky or like a coup happens or like this is the thing because we're not going a straight path. There are no turning points. We are just in a spiral up or down. Depends. I mean, Republicans are already beefing up their attacks on Kamala Harris. They're pivoting. What are we seeing there? I think they're in an interesting bind here because they can't be like super awful because of Usha Vance. That's J.D. Vance's wife. Yes, correct. And who is uh, South Asian herself. Um, And notably, J.D. Vance has come after people who have said things verging on racism about his wife, even if they're like critiques of his actual (laughs) policy. He's been like, you're being racist towards my wife. And, And I noted he was one of the few people to pronounce Kamala's name vaguely correctly at the RNC. Yeah, I mean, he has Indian in-laws. Like, they would hit him if he said it wrong, as they should. So, like, <laughs> like it's it's a, it's a different game. Like, they pick that Veep and that Veep's family. That slot's in different when you're running against Biden, but that's not what's happening anymore. So I... I don't know what they're going to do. I think right now, some of the, a lot of the talk has been like, it's sort of the same of what we had heard in 2019. Kamala's dangerous. She's scary. She's radical. She's a progressive. It's all nonsense. No, she's not. But like, that's how they're going to frame her. I think some people's base or instincts to be sexist and racist isn't really going to land here because of who they picked as Veep. And I think now the Republicans are in this weird They're stuck. Like the dog whistle doesn't sound the same anymore. They got to find a new whistle. I think they're going to hit her on immigration. Like, I think they're going to hit her on you knew Biden was incompetent and you stuck around. You know, it's like those that's what they're going to hit her with. But I do feel like it'll be interesting to see them navigate the race and gender stuff because of all the stuff you're talking about. Yeah, I think they're going to be really bad at it. And I'm 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 curious if the Democrats will be good at pointing it out. Because I don't think they always are. And I'd be curious how she handles it. I think the first evidence we got, because there's really so little that Kamala Harris's goofy internet energy could work for the Democrats, was Sunday night. And that's because the Democrats had their single biggest day for online donations in years. Yeah. I mean, name recognition is powerful like i i think it is i think it is better to be the joke than to be forgotten and trump proved that i'm so glad you said that because i feel like um kamala where she is it kind of mirrors trump in some ways like being at the rnc with hulk hogan and kid rock and all the rest it was so over the top goofy but it reveled in it and it allowed the whole event to be a giant party. And that's the energy Kamala Harris is channeling in all these memes. It's party energy. You know, I saw some picture of a bunch of guys on Fire Island with like brat t-shirts like repping Kamala last night. Yeah, And I was like, yeah, this is like the analog to what the RNC was doing. It's like a version of a cowboy hat from a Texas delegate. Yeah. I mean, I think the celebrity here is an effective tool. And fucking finally, that somebody in the Democratic Party has looked around and been like, maybe we should use that. Like, maybe we do kind of have to fight a little bit fire with fire, not in the way of like, you know, shitty policy or saying terrible things about other people or making fun of, you know, a journalist with a physical disability, for example. But like bombast and image and iconography and color and story does a lot of work. I mean, that's always been true of American elections. People here vote based off of story. That's why these debates are important. Like Biden's numbers dropped because we had to look at him and the story he was telling us about his health and his mental acuity did not match with what was happening. And so I think it's going to be so interesting to see how she and her camp harness this. They have such an opportunity here. I hope they run with it because I think it'll be really fun. (laughs) But how does she embrace her memification while also somehow becoming more presidential? Like, is that even possible? I mean, yeah, it's going to be a really, really tough line to walk. And I I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I am curious to see what she does when SNL comes back next season, because I think like that's kind of going to be where she goes. Like, is she going to do the late night circuit? So I saw a tweet the other day being like, she should do hot ones. She 100% should do hot she ones. She 100% should do hot ones. <laughs> this is the internet show where people eat progressively hotter chicken wings. Yes. yes. And they throw up and they cry. I think go for it. I This, this is a cursed election. It's so doomed. 
I don't even know what to say about it anymore. I don't know what's going to happen. I think they should just throw balls to the wall and let her go nuts. I don't know if she wants to go nuts, though. That's that's going to be I the know, thing. And I think, yeah, that's actually the thing they have to work on is if she is determined to still be an old world politician where things work the way that they work and like I'm in my little suit and look how powerful I am and I'm being very serious. I don't know that that's going to work. But my hope is that she ha- that somebody, some intern or perhaps like her stepdaughter has sat her down and been like, Mamala, let me show you what people have been making about you. And they just sit there and tell her like, this is kind of the only way because being serious about this shit, it's not working. It's not working. Okay, last question. Is there a chance that this whole conversation we're having right now is very, very niche? Like it's just about 500,000 extremely online people and those aren't even the people who need to turn out and vote, like the people who need to turn out and vote aren't on X or Twitter or whatever. They're maybe on Facebook. And so, like, who cares about the memification of Kamala? I mean, maybe. But I personally do not believe that an undecided voter exists in America. I think that person is lying. (laughs) So, like, I think the game here is trying to get people who are already, you know, center and center left, who might not have been really excited to vote for Biden and were maybe going to sit out or don't give a shit or, you know, donors who weren't going to throw money at this because they were like, this is a losing ticket. I think that's where the power is. So leaning into the joke, I uh, always think is the way to go. I also think if my 74 year old father is like giving me a call and being like, hey, why is everybody talking about Kamala Harris and coconuts? Like, that it means it's broken through. It's completely broken through. Like if Vijay Cole knows, that means everybody knows. So like, <laughs> I think it's tipped over. I think we're all here. I think most of us know something is um, is happening with her and with the memification of her and with you know her iconography. So I I do think I think it's different. I think it's different, and I think it's bigger. Saji, I'm super grateful for you coming on the show. Thanks for doing it. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to see, you know, I can't vote. So I can't wait to see what you guys do uh, in a couple of months. <laughs> Sachi Cole is a senior writer for Slate. All right, that's the show. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Madeline Ducharme, and Anna Phillips. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the senior director of podcast operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you back here next time.